and I need you to, excuse me, to open your Bibles this morning. We're going to, um, we're going to go to the 11th chapter of the book of Acts and spend some time in Acts 11 and 13 this morning in this Bible class period. And while you're opening your Bible, thank you again for, for being with us. It's so good to be with you this morning. I, uh, I mentioned, excuse me, I choked a little bit. I mentioned a moment ago being with, with Ricky and Jordan and how much they mean to us, and certainly also with Tim and Vicki. And man, what a blessing to see both of them here. One of the true highlights of this particular week in the spring is getting to sing with Tim. And Tim and Vicki make such a difference for good in the kingdom of God. It's just appreciate appreciate both of you more than I can say. And wonderful to see Vicki doing so well. What an answer to prayer. And what a blessing from God for that. I want to talk with you for a few moments this morning about, about some things about the church at Antioch. Antioch doesn't get a lot of play, but I, I want us to think about it this morning. I have, a, I have a nephew who discovered in college that he has a penchant for the sciences. In fact, more than a penchant, he, he discovered that he really is, and he's gifted in the sciences. In fact, to be quite honest, he's my nephew, but I'm telling you the absolute truth. He, he is a veritable genius in the scientists, sciences. Now, I got to tell you, this was a well-guarded secret for 20 years. <clears throat> but um, once he discovered that, he got, a, he got a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in biomed- biomedical research. <clears throat> he got a PhD in the same discipline from Vanderbilt University. And then he was in, <clears throat> invited by the University of Zurich in Switzerland to do postdoctoral work there. And so he, he went to Zurich, <clears throat> and he did his postdoc work there. And while he was there, he, they sent him all across the continent, and he went to symposiums with Nobel, Nobel laureates, and, and he early on <clears throat> was published widely in scientific journals. <clears throat> but he and his wife, were, they were up there in Zurich, Switzerland, they're alone. And so he had, he had reached out to me. He said, hey, Uncle Don, next time you're in Italy, because I go to Italy to preach, he said, would you please come up and see us? And so I did. At the end of a preaching trip to Italy, I, I popped up to Zurich, and I, and I saw, saw my nephew and, and his wife. And so we're, we're sitting there, we're having dinner, and we're talking, and everything is just fine. And he, and he says, uh, he said, well, Uncle Don, he said, uh, I almost died last week. And I said, well, what, what do you mean you almost died? And he said, well, he said, I couldn't sleep, so I got up in the middle of the night, and I went to our lab, and he said, I, I was going to do some, some work because I couldn't sleep. And so I, I went in the freezer to retrieve the samples that I had been working on. And he said, when I went in the freezer, he said, the, the door closed behind me, and I was locked in. And he said there was no cell service in the freezer, of course. And he said nobody was going to come to the lab for several hours yet. And he said, I, he said, I just, I thought I was going to die. And he said, but then I said, well, clearly you didn't die. So I, you know, I don't know what he said. Well, he said, I, I got to look in and there was a sign by the door that said, there was a sign by the door that said instructions for opening the door if you're locked in the freezer. And I, and I asked him, I said, well, you know, Justin, do genius PhD biomedical scientific nerds tend to lock themselves in the freezer? I mean, is this, is this an everyday occurrence where they got to put a sign up there for you? And he, he laughed about that. And I, I said, well, I said, you know, Justin, the Lord was in there with you too. And he said, yes, I know. He said, but I got to tell you, Uncle Don, the Lord wanted to get out too. <laughs> I took that little incident away because it seems to me that we need to talk about that, that God does want to get out, that God wants to get out of the building and he wants to get into our communities and into our world. And he wants us to be a part of that. I think God wants us to look across the table at our families and he wants us to walk across the street to those with whom we do and share life. And he wants us to reach around the world and use whatever resources we can to touch to touch others. I think God does not intend for us to be a part of a community of believers like this so that we could just have an interesting group with which we can come and and worship and have opportunities there. But I think he wants our mission to be to be his mission. And and what is that? Well, you know, his his mission, let me get our PowerPoint up here again. His mission is that that and he wants us to go and to proclaim the gospel to all of creation. That's our mission. 
He wants his people to <clears throat> go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to all of, to all of creation. But what is that? What, what would that mission be? Well, there are a couple of, a couple of beginning places there. I think one is that <clears throat> God wants us to understand that, that people need the gospel. If people didn't need the gospel, then Jesus wouldn't have told it to take us to everybody. I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? It's axiomatic. If people didn't need the gospel, Jesus wouldn't have told us to take the gospel to all of creation. Now, with that, with that first principle, <clears throat> there come a couple of, a couple of simple, simple observations and assumptions there. Number one, it is <clears throat> that the world, the world needs saving. The world needs saving. That people don't just need to be repaired. They need to be redeemed. That, in fact, we sold our soul to the devil and a price was paid for our redemption. And individuals need to know and understand about that. That's why Jesus referred to his coming into the world really as a, as a search and rescue mission. Have you ever thought about the fact that the Bible says that when God Almighty and Jesus Christ looked from heaven at this world, they looked and they pronounced the world, Isaiah 1 and verse 5, they pronounced the world to be sick, sick in sin. In fact, Ephesians 2 and verse 1, they said the world is dead in their trespasses and in their, in their sin. And in Jeremiah 10 and 23, they said that it's without direction because the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man who walks to direct his own steps. And they were without hope. Ephesians 2 and beginning in verse 12, the world was without God and therefore they were without hope in this world. But most frighteningly, they pronounced the world to be lost. Lost. Now that's a word we don't use very often. But the amazing thing, ladies and gentlemen, is that God and His Son, Jesus Christ, they care about every single sick, dead, directionless, hopeless, lost individual in this world. It's why Jesus said that the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. Now, we talk about seekers, and we talk about the unchurched. But Jesus said that He was come to seek and to save the lost. That's a hard concept for us to, to sign off on in 2024, isn't it? I mean, think about it. We, we live in an all-inclusive, everybody gets a trophy kind of world, right? I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay. God loves us anyway. And so it's hard for us to realize that that neighbor that is so friendly or that coworker that is so helpful or that fellow student that is so brilliant or that family member that is so loved, it's hard for us to remember sometimes that if they've not been obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ, they are lost. But that was God's pronouncement. And so he told a parable about a shepherd. And he had a hundred sheep and one of them wandered away. <laughs> it was lost. And so the shepherd would drop everything that he was doing to go and find the one lost sheep. Why? Because everybody in that culture knew that if you were a lost sheep, it was not going to be long before you were a dead sheep sheep and thus part of the part of the care that shepherds in a local church have for the flock is to retrieve and try to to save the lost in mark 4 and beginning in verse 38 when that storm comes up on the sea of galilee and they they think they are going to die the the, the disciples wake up jesus and they say mark 4 and 38 they say don't you care that we are about to perish but literally it is don't you care that we are about to be lost and the point of it is that, that Jesus said that those who are away from him, those who are away from him, that they are in danger of death, death in their soul, and thus death in eternity, and we have to care about that. When the church loses its urgency about that, listen to me, when the church loses its urgency about that, we have lost sight of part of the mission that Jesus Christ gave us. And so to Jesus, the gospel isn't just good news, it's essential news. See, we like to say the gospel is good news. It's good news for everybody. We love the gospel, <clears throat> but it's essential. It is absolutely essential news. And the essential element of the essential news is Jesus Christ, right? And so <clears throat> what did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except by me. Have you ever thought about that? Think about what was lost in Eden. In Eden, in Eden, because of a lack of truth, because of believing a lie, Adam and Eve lost an element of life. And because of that, God put up a barrier whereby <clears throat> the way to the tree of life was now blocked. And Jesus comes on the scene and he says, look, <clears throat> I am the way and I am the truth and I am the life. And so what was lost in Eden is found in Jesus, but it's only found in Jesus. The only way to have access again to the tree of life 
is through Jesus. And so the essential element of the essential news is Jesus Christ. Acts 4 and 12 says the same thing. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus would say, John 8 and 24, unless you believe that I am, unless you believe I am, am, and he used those words, obviously, for a reason. They would identify with the covenantal name of God in Exodus 3. I am that I am, except you believe that I am. You will die in your sins. And so the early Christians did not preach the gospel simply as a nice thing to do for people. They preached the gospel as an absolute necessity to have life. And so people need the gospel. But the gospel also needs people. In other words, God needs people to disseminate the good news of the gospel. Now, God didn't have to do it that way. That you and I both know. I mean, we, we hear these lessons about evangelism, and we, hear, we, we all know, kind of all know what's coming here, right? And so he's counting on us. He wants people to preach the gospel, to teach the gospel, to share the gospel. He's counting on people. But have you ever thought God didn't have to do it that way? God did not have to do it that way. God could have had the angels circumnavigate the globe every single night preaching the gospel from heaven in the language of every nation. He could have done that. God could have had the stars every night ride out in the heavens. He that believes and the baptized will be saved. God could have done that. He could have, he could have gotten the message out in other ways through nature, but he doesn't do that. He counts on people, and he is relentless, relentless in his pursuit of the lost. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 14, God desires that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of truth. God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of truth. Again, Luke 19 and 10, I am come, Jesus said, to seek and to save that which was lost. I want us to see how that played out on the biblical page. you have your Bible today? Let's read a little bit in the book of Acts chapter 11. Antioch is such a fascinating church. Antioch doesn't get a lot of attention. I mean, let, let's, let's, there are no epistles written to Antioch. In Revelation 2 and 3, when the seven churches are mentioned, Antioch is not one of them. But it's a great church. It's a great church. And what do you always say? The church is, what do you always say? People, right? The church is people. And so if it's a great church, it means that it was composed of great people. And so we need to, we need to read about these great people and see why God spoke of them the way that he did on the biblical page. So I want you to read with me. Let's begin in Acts 11, the beginning Acts 11, and let's, let's begin at verse, uh, verse number 19. Acts 11, verse 19. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen, they traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to nobody except, <clears throat> except Jews. In other words, there are no Gentiles. They're not preaching to Gentiles, just Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists. And they preached the Lord Jesus. The hand of the Lord was with them. And <clears throat> a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Well, this report came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And so they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And notice this. When he came and he saw the grace of God, he was glad. And he encouraged them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. Because Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many, <clears throat> a great many of the people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And they were there well, a whole year, meeting with the church, and they taught a great many people. And then the statement we're familiar with, in Antioch, <clears throat> the disciples were first called Christians. Now go over with me to chapter 13, and here's a little bit of the rest of the story. Chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. Now there were in the church in <clears throat> at Antioch <clears throat> prophets and teachers. There was Barnabas and Simon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them, and they sent them off. Now, there are multiple elements that coalesce in that, in that story. Obviously, you've heard this before, I know in Bible classes, that Antioch is a church of first. There are a number of first things that happen here in Antioch. For example, the disciples are called Christians first in Antioch. Well, how many sermons have you heard along that line? 
How many times have you heard <clears throat> the word Christian is only used three times in your New Testament? Well, we've all heard that. Now, we use that word a lot, right? We'll, we'll, talk about, we'll talk about a Christian bookstore. We'll talk about a Christian college. And we'll talk about a Christian camp and a Christian school. And we understand what we mean by that. I'm not quibbling with that. We all know what we mean by that. <clears throat> and yet, that's not really the way the, the word was used in the New Testament. It's used three times, we said, and you know that. You're good Bible students. Acts 11 and 26 here, the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. What do we learn from that? Well, we learn that a Christian is a disciple. He is someone who has decided that he is going to conform, Romans 8 and 29, he's going to conform his life to the image of God's dear son. So he's not going to just learn from Jesus, but he's going to try to walk in the steps of Jesus to the best, to the best of his ability. Second use is in Acts 11 and, or Acts 26 and 28. And you've got Agrippa speaking to Paul, and it's familiar language. You've heard this, where he says, Paul, do you think that in such a short time you will persuade me to be a Christian? Well, what does that mean? It means that a Christian is a persuaded person. He's not a person who is a Christian because his mom and dad forced him into the baptistry, or because by peer pressure of his spouse, or any other external circumstance, but he is a Christian because he has been reasoned with by Scripture and he has been persuaded that Jesus is the Christ, and he has acted upon that. And then the third verse is 1 Peter 4 and verse 16. If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this name. And so it teaches us that a Christian is somebody who is committed, committed to the point that if they have to suffer, and kind of a foreign concept to us in America, but if he has to suffer for the sake of his faith, he's going to take it. He will not relent. He will not recant. He will not back away. He will not do what so many in the book of Hebrews were doing when they were abandoning their faith because, because of the pressure of the moment. And so the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. But secondly, Antioch was the first church seemingly to cross ethnic boundaries to include Gentiles. Aren't you grateful for that? Because most of us, if not all of us in this room, we are Gentiles. We have one individual of Jewish heritage in our church family at Temple Terrace, but most of us are Gentiles. So aren't you grateful that Antioch, Antioch just didn't sit on the curb and wave the flag while the parade was going on. They got out and led the charge. They were leading the parade. They were the first to cross ethnic boundaries to include Gentiles. And then third, they seem to be the very first to send out preachers. Think about it, ladies and gentlemen. In the intervening years from Acts 13, think about hundreds and hundreds of thousands of missionary journeys that have taken place, missionary trips that have occurred. But this was the first. This was the very first one. And so God says, look, I'm going to take these two individuals and they're going to be the flagship of what I want done in taking the gospel to the world. And so Antioch seems to be the first church that intentionally pursues church planting on a, on a larger basis. Isn't it interesting? Think about it. The Holy Spirit, you ever thought about the fact that the Holy Spirit had to winnow through so much information and, <clears throat> and decide what he was going to give us his Bible? That the Holy Spirit decided that we needed to see Antioch as the kind of church that God wanted planted through the world. And the Holy Spirit seemingly understood that we needed to see that God chose leaders from Antioch to go and take the gospel to the nations. Surely there's a lesson for that in us. Well, from Antioch, from Antioch, I think there are two foundational applications. Two foundational applications. Ricky, remind me what time we stop. 1040, 1040. That's, that's, that's tax day. That's not a good number. Uh, we're we're going to stop at 1041 this morning, ladies and gentlemen. There are two foundational applications here. Here's the first. What we sing, the blessed gospel, is for all. That's one of the applications that we read from Acts, or we glean from Acts 11 and 13. The church in Antioch, listen, the church in Antioch believed that people need Jesus. The text says, listen to the text, a large number of the Hellenists or the Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. Many people were being brought to the Lord. Now, what I deduce from that is that they were not just teaching an ethic. They were not just saying things like, just be nice. Just, just be nice. I hear God's will for you is that you just go be kind to everybody. It wasn't just that. And they weren't just teaching a philosophy. It wasn't some kind of pop psychology, passing this 
spirituality. It wasn't, you know, you be you or you were a nut. That's not what they were saying at all. They were specifically calling upon people to follow Jesus, to surrender their lives to Jesus, to be obedient to Jesus, to be conformed to the image of Jesus. And they did so by preaching a gospel that could save anyone. <clears throat> it wasn't in, in Antioch. Do not miss this. It was in Antioch that the gospel was freed from its cultural trappings because the text says that they'd only been preaching to the Jews. Now, we got that event in Acts 10 with Cornelius, but they were only preaching to the Jews. And so if you were a Gentile, Jewish Christians pretty well believed that you, you had to become a Jew so that you could become a Christian. And if you wanted to know Jesus, you first had to know Moses. But Antioch seems to be the first church that took those handcuffs away. As you might well imagine, I'm confident there were, there were some Jewish Christians not happy about that. Barnabas was sent from Jerusalem. And it's interesting that when Barnabas gets there from Jerusalem, he sees what's going on, and he rejoices. He is glad when he sees, sees the grace of God. I'm sure there were others that it was not so much. Now, all of that, we said in the first hour, you know, it kind of led to the most important conference in the history of the church in Acts chapter 15. But in Acts 15, at that conference, Peter makes one of the, one of the most profound and meaningful statements that you'll find in your New Testament when he says, we believe that we are all saved the same way, by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. And so it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. It doesn't matter if you're black or white. It doesn't matter your, your race, your ethnicity. It doesn't matter. We believe that we are all saved the same way by the undeserved grace of God. Now that, ladies and gentlemen, is a gospel that you can take to the entire world. And that's what they did. And I'll tell you, there was nobody, there was nobody that embraced that, I think, probably more tenaciously and passionately than the Apostle Paul. Because there was nobody who needed that truth, that we are saved by the undeserved grace of God. There was nobody that needed that more than the Apostle Paul. I don't know what bad things you've done in your life, but I'll guarantee you probably don't have I killed Christians on your resume. But Paul did. And so he said, look, <clears throat> here's a, Here's a trustworthy say that's worthy of acceptance by all. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I, I am the worst. But it was for that very reason that I was shown mercy. So that in me, the worst, and he says it again, I'm the worst of sinners. Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. There's a principle that comes out of those two verses that the church is at her best when she when she believes that the gospel can save the worst. The gospel, ladies and gentlemen, takes the broken and the ruined and the wicked and it claims them for Jesus because the gospel can save anybody. So the blessed gospel is for all, but I will tell you, it's also this, whosoever will may come. Now here's the other side of the equation. Whosoever will, whosoever wants to come to the Lord, can. Antioch was the first church, seemingly, to intentionally cross those racial, ethnic boundaries with the gospel. Antioch was like most first century cities. It, it, was, a, it was a segregated city. And each, each element of the po population, they stayed holy among themselves. We, we've experienced some of that. We mentioned this in the first lesson. We've experienced some of that in America, particularly in the last several years. We've experienced that politically, where the divide among brethren politically is, is unlike anything that I've ever seen before in my, in my lifetime. We, we face some of that, we face some of that with, with COVID, and we face some of that racially in our nation. But the Christians in Antioch broke that mold. The Christians in Antioch, <clears throat> they came together, these individuals of different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different races, Jew, Gentiles, now mingling, mixing together, they came together and seemed to enjoy being together and benefited from being together. Well, how could that possibly happen? How could you do that in the first century world that was segmented in such a rigid way with such tightly drawn lines? Well, because the disciples were first Christians. Before they were Jewish Christians or Gentile Christians, before they were black Christians or white Christians or Hispanic Christians, 
They were just Christians. They were disciples being conformed to the image of God's dear Son. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus touched the unclean. Jesus spoke to Samaritans. Jesus prayed to Gentile centurion as having greater faith in all of Israel. Jesus honored women that were given no status in that culture. Jesus took little children in his arms and he blessed them. He was the he was the forerunner of what Antioch did. And so that was their example. It was Jesus who said that God so loved the world that is all of his human creation. God so loved the world and he expects us to do the same. It is only Jesus Christ who can bring that kind of reconciliation and community. And so from membership to leadership, the church in Antioch modeled brotherhood among very different people. And it's interesting that God chose, don't miss this, God chose Antioch as the example that he put in Scripture to send that message. He didn't choose Jerusalem. Why not? Because they weren't doing what Antioch did. He chose Antioch because that's, <clears throat> that's the model that he wants to go into the, into the entire world. When Paul is on those three missionary journeys, he does not plant mono-ethnic churches. That would have been easier. Because, I mean, let's, let's be honest. Mono-ethnicity is, it makes it, it makes it easier in a church. Because multi-ethnic churches sometimes is messy. And yet Paul understood that if you're going to preach the gospel can save anyone, you've got to, then you've got to put the grace of the gospel on full display and preach it to everyone. Because a gospel, lady, listen to me, a gospel that only makes people right with God and doesn't reconcile them to other human beings is not a full gospel. And so Paul would write and say, look, Jesus Christ himself is our peace who has made us both want. He has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, killing the hostility. Because the hostility between Jew and Gentile in the first century world was real and pronounced, and the lines were drawn with rigidity. And Paul writes, as he has gone throughout the world, and he has planted these multi, multi-ethnic churches everywhere that he went, and he says the reason for that is that that's what Jesus Christ envisioned. The point of it is, ladies and gentlemen, that walls come down, when the cross is lifted up. Isn't that what Jesus said? And I, if I be lifted up, I will draw, what's the next word? All. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And that's what Antioch got. And that's the example that God wrote in Scripture for us to emulate. Now, <clears throat> if you will, I've got 10 minutes left. And so I want to, I want to mention four things to you. When I was with you last, when I was with you last in this Bible class period, at the end of that lesson on evangelism, and that too was out of the book of Acts, but at the end of that lesson, I talked about the fact that there are four things that everybody can do in evangelism, that there are four things that everybody can do in evangelism. <clears throat> Nine, and I, I, want to, I want to remind you of those four things. Now, I know you've probably, you probably wrote them down, you probably got them on a post-it note on your mirror so you can see them every morning. And every morning you think, well, I, you know, Don taught us those four things. But just in case you haven't done that, I want to remind you, I want to remind you of those four things that I mentioned because I, I just think everybody can do these things. It doesn't matter if you're 8 years old or 18 years old or 80 years old. You can do these four things. It doesn't matter if you have a Ph.D. or you didn't finish high school. It doesn't matter. You can do these four things. Everybody can do these four things in evangelism. So could I just remind them? Could I just remind you of those four things before we, <clears throat> before we stop this morning? Here they are. Number one, everybody can shine. You remember that? Everybody can shine. That's what Jesus said. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And he followed it up by saying, by the way, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. He doesn't say, he doesn't say look, you need to become the light of the world. He doesn't say you have the potential to be the light of the world. He says, as a Christian, you are the light of the world. And so let your light so shine before men. Wherever you find yourself, whatever the circumstance may be, make sure that you let your light shine. That means that you live your life. It's a very simple thing, isn't it? 
You just live your life the way the Lord wants you to live it. It means that you moderate your behavior and live according to the gospel. And you live right, whether in this building. Now, in this building, it's pretty easy, isn't it? But when you go to school tomorrow, that means you live right. When you go to work tomorrow, it means that you, you live according to the gospel. When, you, when you're at the gym this week and you're, <clears throat> you're working out or you're recreating in some, some way, you do that. When you're a young person, you're on a date. It means that you behave like a Christian should behave. When you are, you fill in the blank there. Whatever it is, you do that because you're going you're gonna to shine. You're going to live your life in such a way that reflects well because that's what light does. It reflects well on the gospel and on, on Jesus Christ. When Paul wrote in Titus 2, by the way, he wrote to aged men and aged women and young men and young women. In the middle of that, he said to one of those groups, he said, look, make sure that you live your life in such a way that an unbeliever can never malign the gospel by looking at your life. That is, make sure that you live in such a way that no unbeliever could ever look at your life and say, if that's a Christian, then I want no part of it. So everybody, everybody can shine. Secondly, everybody can speak. Everybody can speak. And I know that when I say that, I probably just lost half of you right there. I mean, on the first one, everybody's on board with that. But as soon as I say everybody can speak, man, eyes begin to roll back in their head and say, no, can't do that. Can't do that. But yes, you can. Yes, you can. Listen to what I mean by that. You remember what Jesus said in Matthew 10 and verse 32 when he said, whoever will confess me before men, him will I also confess before my Father who is in heaven. Now, he's been talking about the confession before baptism there, right? If you want that confession, you go to Romans 10 and verse 4. With the heart, men believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. But here, it's in the context of, whoever denies me before men, I would deny before my Father who is in heaven. So he just says, I want you to own me. Everybody can do that. I think our challenge with that is that we don't think along those lines. But if we just begin to think about that, we can, we can do that. Because we do that with everything else, right? We naturally, we naturally talk about things that we're interested in or things that we love. And so <clears throat> in this building day, here you are. And when, when the amen is said and you're talking with somebody, if you're a grandparent and somebody asks you about your grandchild, you're not going to have any trouble talking about your grandchild. In fact, even if they don't ask you, you may bring it up. And what you may even, you may even start to show them pictures on your phone. Now, they're going to walk away at that point, but you, you may do that. You may do it because we, we love those kids. I mean, they, they mean the world to us. And, and we, talk about, we talk about sports, you know, sports that are important to us. We, we don't have any trouble talking about that. Our kids, grandkids, and kids, 14, we, we talk about things that matter to us. And we're the people who say that the most important thing in the world to us is the gospel and Jesus Christ and his church and our church family. Well, if that's true, ladies and gentlemen, we, we shouldn't have difficulty talking about that. God should be in our conversation. Let people know. Let people know that you think about them. Let people know you're going to pray for them. It's an easy thing to do once we begin thinking, <clears throat> thinking in those terms. And third, everybody can invite. The easiest thing you will ever do in evangelism is invite somebody to come to worship. That is the easiest thing you'll ever do in evangelism, to just, to just invite somebody to come and, and to worship, to do what they did in, in John chapter 1, when they said, just come and see, come and see. We believe we have found, we found the Messiah. We believe he is Jesus of Nazareth. Well, you know, the response was, well, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? When I was at Florida College, we named the cafeteria Nazareth because no good thing ever came out of there. <clears throat> well, so they said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And, and you remember what they said? Come and see. Don't, don't take our word for it. Just, just come and see. The easiest thing you'll ever do in evangelism is invite others to come to worship. Because what's the worst thing can happen? The worst thing that can happen is that they might say no. Well, we can handle that. But, you know, Barna continues to say in every, in every piece of research, that about 25% of unchurched Americans say that they would accept an invitation from a friend to go to their worship service. And so we need to invite. And then when folks accept that invitation, we, we've got to welcome them. We've got to welcome them. Remember what <clears throat> James talked about? If they're coming to your assembly, and I realize there's a whole point there about acting prejudicially toward them, but I want you to notice that James says when somebody comes into your assembly that doesn't, they're new to you, he, he just expects that you're going to notice. 
and that you're going to pay attention to them. And in fact, when Paul wrote about that in 1 Corinthians 14, he said, let me tell you, when an unbeliever comes into your assembly, the onus, the onus of responsibility is on you, not them. So that when they leave, if they don't get anything else, Paul says, they will at least be able to leave and say, you know what? God is among those people. The way that they treated me, the way they treated each other, and by the message they taught, the one thing I know is that God is among those people. Well, the only way that that can happen is if we open our eyes, if we open our eyes and invite and welcome. I, uh, at home at Temple Terrace, I've said many times at home that I, um, I'm not much into drive-by guiltings. I don't, I don't stand in front of the church at Temple Terrace and try to make them guilt, feel guilty about things. I've never stood in front of a church and said, hey, you know what? Statistics indicate that today, today, in America, 8,615 people are going to die, which is true, by the way. And most of those people are going to die lost. And that's, that's also true, by the way. And you know what? It's your fault that they're dying lost. No, that's not true. If they die lost, it's because they made a choice. They made a choice, and they'll have to deal with the consequences. But we do have a responsibility, and our responsibility is to introduce people to Jesus. What they do after the introduction is entirely up to them. But as we said a moment ago, we're God's plan A, and he doesn't have a plan B. And so when you think about it, we have to be someone. We said that a minute ago. We've got to, we've got to be the someone. The Ethiopian in Acts 8, he had scripture, lots of scripture, new scripture, but he needed, he needed someone to help him in that, to help him in that understanding. Saul of Tarsus in Acts 9, he had a vision and a conversation with, with the risen Lord, but he needed someone. He needed an Ananias to, to tell him the gospel more fully. Cornelius in Acts 10, he had a vision as well, but he needed the apostle Peter. He needed someone to help get him from point A to point B. So this morning, let me end where we begin. We need, ladies and gentlemen, we need to look to look across the table and impact our family, our children and grandchildren with the gospel, influence them in every way that we can. We need to walk across the street. Now, maybe that's to work or maybe it's a school or maybe it's where we recreate ourselves, but with those with whom we do life, we need to walk across the street and we need to reach around the world to use the opportunities and resources and personnel that God has put at our disposal in an amazing church like this to do what we can to reach around the world. Because again, we are God's plan A and he has no plan B. Thank you for listening so well this morning. Thank you for connecting with us this morning. We're so thankful that you were able to do that. If you have questions, we'd love to have the opportunity to talk to you. You can contact us at www.thebibleway.com or questions at thebibleway.com. Questions at thebibleway.com. We'd love to have you in person. Come if you can. But thank you for connecting with us.